the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. I'm Amanda Whiting, the museum event coordinator, and I want to thank you for coming out here today for this exciting talk on Naomi. It's been an honor for the museum to exhibit Naomi Lindenfeld's wonderful work this spring, along with uh, the work of her mother. And we're grateful that she's agreed to talk with us today about the exhibit and also about her work in general. Uh, Naomi took her first pottery class Later, she earned a degree in ceramics from BU's program in artistry. She was also a founding member of Brattleboro Clay Works and has been teaching ceramics at the Putney School since 1998. Naomi has a studio in West Brattleboro where her visitors are welcome by appointment. Please welcome Naomi Lindenfeld. born in 1921 in Wuppertal, Germany. Her father insisted that she pursue a practical profession, and for about a year after high school, she studied fashion design. That got cut short when her family had to flee overnight from the Nazis. Uh, they first went to Holland for about a year, and there she worked in the workshop in which Queen Wilhelmina's clothes were made. She learned uh, embroidery and sewing techniques there. And then once they were able to come to the U U.S., they settled in Brookline, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. She got seamstress jobs, and for a while she was the main financial support for her family. Then she got a job at a place called The Window Shop in Cambridge. They made a point of employing German and Austrian refugees. Many of the women there were older than her and came with their pastry and cooking skills. There was a gift shop and dress shop and a cafe. Uh, she worked there as a sales clerk, and she also helped uh, women to adopt craftwares to an American market. And this is actually my mother on the cover of a book called The Window Shop. My mother did not think that getting a, an American college education would be attainable, but she was encouraged to apply for a scholarship through The Window Shop. She found out about Black Mountain College near Asheville, North Carolina, and she did get a scholarship from the window shop to attend a year there. She was ready to pack up and leave after that year, uh, but the mother of another student found out that she would have to leave because the scholarship was coming to an end. That woman, amazingly enough, told her that she would pay for the rest of her education. Black Mountain College existed between 1933 and 1957 and was based on progressive principles which believed that the arts were central to a liberal arts education. I had an informal, it, it had an informal collaborative spirit and turned out to be quite an experimental avant-garde environment. Many who taught and were students there became influential figures, such as a group of painters that were a big part of the abstract expressionist movement, Robert Rauschenberg, Lohan de Kooning, and Franz Klein as well as composer John Cage, uh, designer, architect, inventor, Buckminster Fuller, choreographer, Nurse Cunningham, uh, 
photographers, poets, potters, and many others. My mother was able to explore her creativity for the first time without concerns of war and making money. She took a variety of courses there, but spent the majority of her time studying with Joseph and Annie Albers. They had come to Black Mountain from having taught at the German art school, the Bauhaus. Uh, Joseph taught color theory and design, and Annie Albers taught weaving. Uh, they brought the, the Bauhaus influence of combining fine art and craft to their teaching. Um, Annie had extraordinary knowledge of both technical and artistic aspects of weaving. And uh, this is an example of, on the left, uh, one of Annie's uh, weavings that exemplifies the Bauhaus architecture, architecture-influenced modernist style. On the right is also a piece by Annie uh, using newspaper, string, and fiber, and it shows the influence uh, of the Bauhaus in experimenting with unorthodox materials, something that also was encouraged at Black Mountain College. This is my mother's graduation piece from Black Mountain. Uh, it's in the permanent collection of the Renwick Gallery, which is a part of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. It demonstrates complex weaving techniques such as double weave and layering of patterns. With uh, one weft, and, uh, and then she did things of tying the threads together to create those patterns. And some of that was her innovation. Annie Albers' approach was also, also encompassed weaving for industrial production, another indication of Bauhaus' attention to both form and function. Uh, after my mother graduated from Black Mountain, she went to New York City and got a job as a designer for the textile industry. Uh, she continued to do that work for 10 years, uh, and during that time, she worked uh, for some prominent fashion uh, garment designers. Her work was featured in Vogue, Mademoiselle, Harper's Bazaar, and American Fabrics magazines. So this is just one example of uh, her textile work on that garment uh, that was uh, in Vogue magazine. My parents met in New York and moved to New Jersey when my father started teaching physics at Rutgers University. Uh, just before I was born, my mother left her industry job uh, to raise uh, my brother and I. She wove at home and created wall names. By the time I was 10, she started, leaving, uh, she started the weaving department at Middlesex County Community College in Edison, New Jersey. Because Black Mountain College was not an accredited college, she went back to school at Rutgers, uh, and at age 61, uh, earned a degree in creative arts education so that she could get a promotion at Middlesex. <laughs> she taught at Middlesex for 18 years, and then immersed herself more fully in her work that transitioned into fiber collages. Along with teaching adult school at that point, uh, she also worked with the textile curator at the Newark Museum, and uh, then later became a docent at the Princeton University Art Museum. The weaving on the left is inspired by uh, the former art director of Alvin Ailey Dance Company, Judith Jameson, and her sense of movement and dance. Uh, and. Uh, it shows how she, my mother started breaking out of the grid of the loom and really uh, achieved movement in her weavings. And then she felt confined by the loom and got rid of the loom altogether. And that's when she transitioned into doing fiber collage work. <coughs> um, and the one on the right is an example of that. The, the base material that my mother used for her fiber collage pieces is Pelon. And Pelon is facing. It's what sewers use for uh, stiffening collars and uh, uh, using for uh, as a as a stiffening material. It's a, it's actually 
Western polyester and some pressed fabric. And uh, she would take that koan and then add stitching and drawing and different kinds of fibers. And she would adhere fibers uh, and then stitch over it. And um, she had this incredible way of drawing. This is a photo of my mother in front of a retrospective exhibit that she had in uh, near Asheville, North Carolina. Um, that was a gallery that showed a lot of work of Black Mountain College uh, grads. Good about my play background. Um, I grew up hearing riveting stories of Black Mountain College. As well, I was exposed to many artists and crafts people during my childhood. And then, as Amanda said, I took my first pottery class when I was 12 with a friend of my mother's who uh, gave classes in her studio. I, uh, I responded to the immediacy of clay more than what appeared to be the tedium of threading warps on a loom. And besides that, I wanted to do something different than my mother. It was not like Black Mountain College, but it was innovative in other ways. It was based on training students to be professional craftspeople, which was actually a new concept at the time. So, um, college crafts programs uh, at that point in time were mainly geared towards training people to be professional craftspeople. Uh, sorry. We're, we're, we're more geared towards training people to be teachers. Because at that time, it was uh, very unusual for uh, anyone to be making a career from selling crafts. The program combined the practical aspects of selling, setting up a studio and business with the artistic and design training. While working on my degree at BU, I discovered the Japanese technique narakomi of layering colored clays to create patterns. I have been captivated by exploring many ways of working with colored clay ever since. After college, I worked for a few potters, and then soon after moving, Vermont, uh, moving to Vermont, I co-founded the Ralph Rowe Clayworks and seven others. I worked out at the Clayworks for 21 years on Funny Road, and 12 years ago, I set up my studio at my home in West Ralph Rowe, where my husband and I live. Um, my goal has been to combine usefulness and beauty in objects that are lived with on a daily basis. The technique that I've developed involves staining porcelain clay. I then layer the clay into a block. Uh, I take a slice from the block and roll it out with a rolling pin, and then I carve away strips, which reveals layers, the, the different layers of color. And finally, I roll the clay flat and then shape the pieces. Fire them. These are examples of uh, carving leaves uh, in the, with the pattern. Um, first, I when I cut open the block, I get this kind of wood grain pattern with the rings, and then I take this little loop carving tool and carve away, revealing the layers. And then I roll it flat, and it kind of raises that pattern up. So um, the photo on the Right is um, after it's been rolled out and shaping the piece, and then I'm going to wrap it and make a base with it. This is an example of a piece that was thrown on the wheel uh, with the layered colored clay, and then when I carve into it, it reveals all of those striations and uh, kind of sculpt it. Another technique, which happens to be a favorite of mine, is uh, to pinch the clay into a bowl. And then I carve the surface and leave it uh, with a raised texture. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of nesting bowls that are done with that technique. I fired my 
uses in a gas kiln. This is my gas kiln at home. And uh, this is what it looks like when I've just opened the door and it's ready to unload. Freshly fired pots to come tent. <laughs> Seventeen years ago, I became the part-time ceramics teacher at the Putney School, a boarding high school. I had not had aspirations to teach, but I must have teaching genes from my parents, since I discovered that I do love it and continue to be challenged and stimulated by it all these years later. The Putney School and Black Mountain College have deep connections in their progressive philosophies based on John Dewey's teachings and making art an important element to education. A number of children of students and faculty at Black Mountain went to the Putney School, and some Putney students went to Black Mountain. Um, the pairings in the show. Uh, I'm going to move on to the first pairing here while I give a little introduction to making work for the show. My mother's fiber work has clearly always influenced and inspired me. But before this experience of creating work for the show, I had never consciously worked off of her pieces. Because my mother is no longer here, I was the one who made all the selections of which pieces of hers I would work with. I wanted to pick the pieces that I'm most drawn to, and also to consider how I would, could envision translating the essence of her fiber pieces into clay objects. I considered which pieces would show a variety of her styles. I connected more with her fiber collage pieces, which are primarily nature themed, than with her weavings initially. Uh, there are connections between me and my mother's use of innovative methods and aesthetic sensibilities. The sense of movement, abstract quality, uh, makes abstract graphics. fascinating and challenging to interpret a two-dimensional medium within a three-dimensional realm. To not just reproduce my mother's ideas and approaches, but to draw inspiration and design from her pieces as my own. Uh, I'll go through this pairing and talk about my thought process of designing my pieces, and we'll tell you some stories about them. With every piece I made, I tried something that I'd never done before. As I've been working with layered colored clay, I've seen wood grain, grain patterns when I take a slice from a block to work with. I often undulate up and down when I am cutting to emphasize the wood grain like grain. When I design okay, this is phase, this is one of those pieces. When I designed the phase, I got the wood grain look on the front. When the piece was done, I realized that it looked like a piece of cordwood. This repeat with cordwood became an image from my everyday life. My, for my mother, I think that the wood imagery was something that she noticed particularly when she traveled to Japan or Vermont from her home in New Jersey. So her piece is called Forest perspective. Uh, this is a piece that usually hangs in our living room, and I, I particularly love it. Uh, I love how it invites you into the path and through the woods, and I love how the branches intertwine. The piece is inspired by the Vermont woods, where my parents spent their summers since the late, uh, since the early 70s. Right away, I got the idea to make a series of phases with larger 
larger ones in the front and the smaller ones in the back to give the illusion of looking down a path in the forest. It took me a while though to figure out how to depict the branches uh, without adding thin pieces of clay to the vases. Um, in fact, each vase has images of several trees experimented with the different colors for these pieces. Uh, I expanded my color palette in various ways with the pieces in the show. Um, and I used uh, stains that are oxides and they're very much like paints where you can mix them and get different shades and colors. Uh, and I put more yellow in the vases in the front to give the appearance of no longer a set of functional vases, but rather an installation that creates a whole environment. So, um, I'm going to move this one and then I'll move back. Um, the triptych book titled Point Lobos uh, is also a piece that we live with and that I love. Over a year ago, I took a professional level workshop with North Country Studio Workshop. It was a clay sculpture workshop, and I knew I wanted to try and make a piece for this show. I had said he had a fiber collage piece of my mother's that was also from this Point Lobo series uh, that he thought looked a lot more like my sculpture than the book. <laughs> and I hadn't even seen this before I made the sculpture. Uh, I, I saw the Point Lobo's piece with the boulders and I was very struck by how much it looked like my piece. I really liked that both pieces are in the show. One is more abstract and one is more representational. That my piece is somewhere in between the two. The weaving of my mother's uh, that's titled Ceremonial is the one that Mara Williams, the curator of the show, initially saw in our house that prompted her to ask questions about my mother and her work and got her excited about showing the work in the museum. It's a great example.
another piece here she titled Curves and Waves. This led me in the direction of using blues and greens, which was my interpretation of curves and waves. I also knew that I could never match the bright, shiny yellow, red, and black in the way that I fire. Uh, I wasn't that enamored with this weaving when my mother originally made it. I thought that the colors were garish, and I didn't know why she chose to use plastic raffia. It turns out that it's both her rebellion against the movement to use natural hand-dyed fibers, <laughs> um, her wanting to break out of the grid of the loom and make curves, which are not so easy to do in a weaving. And she discovered that she could get plastic raffia from a hat maker in the garment district in New York. And it was a byproduct of that industry. Again, there is the Bauhaus and Black Mountain College influence in using found materials. I, I picked out and chose the quality of the curves and lines to work with in my piece. Because in carving parts of the surface and not other parts, and then rolling it flat, it appears quite three-dimensional, even though the surface is smooth. My mother's piece here has a poem on the back of it by a New Jersey poet named Paul Muldoon, titled Wind and Tree. She was a member of the New Jersey Art Association, they would come up with a theme for their shows, and they would each make a piece based on the theme. For one show, they all chose a poem by a New Jersey poet to inspire their piece. One thing that I started to notice and appreciate more and more as I examined my mother's work closer is all of the drawing that she did with felt-tip pens. She has a beautiful way of drawing, and all the blacks that you see in her pieces drawn. My bowl is pinched, shaped, and carved, and I have two large pinch bowls in the show that are the biggest that I've ever made. I layer a block of colored clay, and I usually get half a dozen pieces from one block. With these pieces, I, <laughs> I heard the train. Um, I pinch the entire block to make these pieces. The clay is so soft that when I pinch it, it wants to sag down into the table. So I had to figure out how to uh, find a form to dry it upside down so that it could hold its shape. And I think I did well achieving that sense of movement in all directions that happens when the wind blows through the trees. I just want to mention before I start talking about the piece that some of these wonderful photos that are taken of my work and my mother's are by Al Karibi. My mother had actually never gotten her work photographed professionally. Uh, she always took her own photos, and it's been wonderful to have really good quality photos that really bring out that sense of texture and, and the way the light hits them. Uh, and she took those Al's photos. Uh, the starting point for Marshland, the Marshland piece that my mother made, is a photograph that she had my father take of a marshland in Trenton, New Jersey. She printed the photo onto the Pellon with an office printer. From there, she added fiber, yarn, and stitching. This too came from a New Jersey Art Association uh, show that had that theme of using that marsh. My mother used the opportunity of those themes to stretch herself creatively to try new ideas and techniques that she may not have done otherwise. I've had very much the same experience working off of her work for this show. I've discovered that having something to respond to brings forth new ideas. Again, I challenged myself in how large a vessel I could pinch the clay into. I then took some of the colored clay and spread it on the surface um, that creates the yellow flowers. And on the other side, there are um, reeds. 
then he showed this photo of, of uh, the pieces in the exhibit because there also is a poem next to the piece. The poem is written by my husband, Michael Bosworth, and he got inspired by the fiber and clay marsh pieces to write, to write this poem. It beautifully conveys the creative connection between my mother and I and our way of working with our respective materials. Very honored that Michael was moved to write the poem for us for the occasion of this show. I hope if you haven't read it yet that you will take a moment to do so. I wanted to include this weaving in a show titled Reflection because it's another great example of the Bauhaus style. It has a simple but striking pattern of the offset triangles and beautiful vivid colors. I looked at it and thought, box. Because of the rectangular shape, I had a vision of making the triangles raised to act as a way to pick up the lid. My work is generally very organic, and I don't particularly enjoy doing anything that requires measuring and precision. <laughs> so I thought of asking my friend Steve Lloyd, who is back here, um, who is an architect and painter, to help me design templates to make the box from. I think it worked out beautifully. I don't think that I would have been able to pull off having the pattern be the same proportions as the weaving and have the lines all match up from the lid to the side without his help. I used the same technique with the box as I did with the five-piece sculpture where I used sculpture clay and then painted layers of terrace gelata and rubbed them off. Um, by working with this, it made me notice uh, that in the weaving, each band has, has different colors and are different sizes from each other. At first glance, it looks very symmetrical, but there are actually all this variation going on there. The piece I made for the show is the Grand Canyon. This triptych of my mother's is one of my very favorite pieces of hers. It's titled Shadow Island Remembered Images. It's inspired by an extended trip that my parents took to Japan. There were burned out trees and rock formations <clears throat> on the island, and she did a whole year's work based on uh, that place. I've never been to Japan myself and hope to go sometime. Because my mother's remembered images were not mine, I thought about what would be the equivalent for me. I then knew that the very that it was a very significant rafting trip that my husband and I took with 14 friends down the Grand Canyon. It was soon after we'd gotten married, and it was a mind-blowing trip. <laughs> it was spectacular, and around every bend. Geology changed, and there were so many connections between the movement and striations in the rocks and what I've been doing all these years with my layered colored clay. Although my piece is probably not geologically accurate, I hope that it, it evokes the Grand Canyon with the pedestal evoking the water. I then come around to the first pairing in the show is the only piece that I did not make consciously for the show. The bowl was on my display shelves in my studio and happened to resonate with my mother's piece titled Wall uh, that was based on a wall in, in Barnard, Vermont. Uh, both have the same, very similar movement lines and color. I had made the bowl for a show Project, I've gained a new and deeper appreciation of my mother's work, and at the same time, I've taken my own work to a new level. And I welcome any questions.
Houston decided to, to do this one. Um, Mara talked to me about the idea of it about two years ago. And I had started working on it uh, really focused about a, a year and a couple months before the show opened. Yeah, and you probably had to do other work along with teaching and doing other work for orders and shows. Yeah, this wasn't the only thing I was working on. Yeah, there are a number of ideas from the pieces I did for the show that I'm going to continue with that translate very well to my functional work. And I also hope to do more sculptural work as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want to get the picture? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to look at it again. I don't remember you like this. <laughs> Brings back memories, huh? Um, this one was in our living room. Growing up, it was a tapestry loom that she used sometimes. She actually had another eight harness loom that was in another room in the house that she used more than this one. This was a, a loom where you could actually see more of the weaving rather than it being, uh, it was more vertical rather than horizontal. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I never really got drawn to weaving myself. seeing you come up for the first time today, I couldn't stop crying. And I think there's something so moving about the connection of daughter and mother and each time your own voices. Mm -hmm. I'm just blown away by that. I mean, it's a clear voice which is, your work is your work. But even in the beginning, you had a connection mm -hmm. with her boldness. But in now, it's almost like a part of maturity, the, the mother-daughter relationship. Yeah. It feels so strong to me that now the mother-daughter relationship can be honored in a, in a, in a, a whole mm -hmm. year. It feels so important to me. I just feel like it's honor this. Yeah, it feels like it was the right time for the show. I really made a conscious effort to not try to copy her work, uh, but to really make it my own. Mm -hmm. So I bring out the essence of, of what her pieces are about. Um, it seems to be kind of more of a comment than a question. It does seem to be a very interesting gift that she continues to use the, mm -hmm. the pushing, the pushing and the mm -hmm. direction that she has been yeah, uh, taking it on. Her spirit is. <laughs> there with me uh, doing that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, my work has evolved over the years, but this was a much bigger leap than I made with my work ever before. I wonder if you were aware earlier, um, before Mara, how much your design and your work was really to some extent, but not as much as when I started working on it. I, I knew that the way I carved is very kind of fiber-like, and um, there, I think I've actually made a point of making uh, patterns where there's that interweaving, uh, crossing over of lines, and, and sure, I, I, I thought of it as fiber-like, and, and my forms are often very soft. It also looks like cloth. So, yeah, I, I have been aware of that. 
see two things, two inferences. I don't know if these were conscious or if they're uh, just something that you did naturally. One is the crimping of the pottery and what there is before the door, the door to preserve the last century. <laughs> and the, the, the multi colors of which are very much of marble and papers and books. Uh -huh. And I was wondering right. if there's any mm -hmm. conscious, conscientious. Materials are being moved around in a fluid way, and um, I could work very geometrically with this technique if I wanted. Um, uh, but I choose to. Uh, I've always been drawn to fluid movement and uh, I love dancing, and, and that comes into my work too. And I think this is probably one of those. And whether uh -huh. one that she did or somebody else did is probably not sure where it was. Mm -hmm. Attributed to the yeah, yeah, Terry and Emma Harris, who's the director of the Black Mountain College Project. Windswept jar. <laughs> um, yeah, very tactile. Yeah, 
Was it, was it a clear connection for you? Like in college, you said that's where you got really attracted to the color play. Yeah. Did um, you have any inkling that, oh, this is a little bit like my mom's birthday gift? Thank <laughs> you. 